that was a thank you everyone for for joining us for this session it's like a um, theater Thank you, Nick and Tech Change, for bringing us all together. I'm really excited for, for the day's talks, including this one. Um, so to kick things off as folks are sitting down in the room, can I get a show of hands of how many people work on information needs in particular during humanitarian crises? Just want to get a sense in the room. OK, a couple hands. And the reason I ask is because we work on so many different aspects of international development, the folks who are gathered in the room and, and online. And so just, you know, this panel, we're going to be zooming in on information needs and the importance of catering to those needs of folks who are caught in sudden humanitarian crises, whether they be, you know, the Ukraine conflict, Afghanistan conflict, or um, humani yeah, uh, natural disasters like earthquakes, wildfires, and floods. Um, today on this, uh, on this panel, we have with us uh, Jordi Kitchen from Google, product manager at Google, uh, Omar Abu Samra um, from the American Red Cross's Global Disaster Preparedness Center, and Liam Nichol from International Rescue Committee's signpost team. Um, uh, and we're going to chat about how each of these organizations in, in similar but also different ways leverage technology to get information out to people in the moments before, during, and after a humanitarian crisis. Uh, my name is Ruha Devanason. I work on strategic uh, partnerships for Google Search. Um, and I'd love to just hand it over and have each of you introduce yourselves and talk about the teams you work on, if that's OK. Liam, should we start with you? Sure, sure, happy to. Um, my name is Liam Nickel. I'm a product manager at the International Rescue Committee's Signpost Project. So as humanitarian actors, um, historically there's been the idea that your role is to be the voice for the voiceless. Um, but that's actually flawed um, because that's assuming that people don't have their own voice and they can't be heard on their own right. So Signpost is a project that kind of centers around the idea that information is power. And through, with that power, we can empower people to make their own decisions in the time of a, co a conflict or a crisis. So uh, our team is a multi-agency um, initiative. We are the International Rescue Committee, Mercy Corps, Internews, and NetHope, partnering together to give people access to information in crisis. Um, what that looks like on the ground is it looks like we have teams of moderators, people to answer questions through social media. We have journalists making content that um, gives people walkthrough information about important things like when is the border open, how to access um, your um, visa, how to gain, um, how to gain support for um, your small business as you move to a new country. And all of this information um, is critical for people to be able to kind of navigate the complex and cacophonous world of humanitarian crises um, with empowerment. Um, so Signpost has been scaling rapidly the last couple years. Um, in the past year, there's 466% um, year over year growth. And a lot of that's due to our um, team's combined efforts to kind of meet people where they are and work with partners in different humanitarian crises such as Afghanistan, Ukraine, uh, and, and more forgotten crises like those at the border of Tanzania and Burundi um, or for Venezuelan migrants who are moving into Ecuador. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a core, our team is dedicated to giving people access so they can make decisions that will help them uh, empower their own lives. Omar? I'm Omar. Uh, I lead the Global Disaster Preparedness Center, which is hosted by the American Red Cross in partnership with the IFRC. Uh, our mandate within the Red Cross Red Crescent Network is to support all 192 Red Cross and Red Crescent societies in their business, which is to help save lives and connect with the community. So my team really uh, helps to try to address and scale uh, solutions to, to meet some of the greatest challenges that we have um, as, a, as a network. 
Uh, and in, in many ways, it's about communicating with the communities that are hard to reach. Um, a lot of times we're, we're looking at how do we leverage technology and tools, but sometimes we're looking at more analog solutions um, to, to really connect with and uh, interpret or communicate some of the problems that are happening um, to, to address the needs of those in the hardest reach, uh, in hardest to reach areas. Uh, my team has uh, three main areas of focus. We do knowledge management. We support a network of, of practitioners uh, with good practice examples and, and uh, uh, approaches. We do research to help uh, expand the evidence base in what we do, and we do technical support to really bridge the gap in learning and experience uh, to make, make that difference. I'll stop there. Thanks, Omar. Jordi? Hey, everybody. My name is Jordi Kitchen. Um, I'm a product manager in Google Search. I started out my career as a software engineer a long time ago. Um, I joined Google 12 years ago, focusing on consumer products at first. Then I moved over to enterprise stuff, working on cloud. And for the last three and a bit years, I've been in search. Um, search is organized into verticals, so these are topic areas. You can think of things like weather or TV and movies. I'm responsible for what are called social impact verticals. These are areas where, where people come to Google looking for help in critical times of need. Um, everything from things related to elections, so how to vote, how to register to vote, where to vote, getting election results, things around economic opportunity, so finding employment, how to get access to food. Um, everything related to sustainability, making more sustainable choices in climate change, and then sort of special projects as well, like things related to COVID or Ukraine. Um, on, my, on the team, we have product managers, engineers, partnerships folks, um, all dedicated to helping people in times of need. And today, I'll be talking a lot about uh, what we've done with the Ukraine crisis and, and how we help people there. I'll, I'll pause there. Awesome. So um, maybe we can use the Ukraine crisis as a jumping off point, but is there a particular moment in the response that your organizations had to this, to this conflict or this crisis that you're proud of or that you think worked really well? Liam, do, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. So uh, at the start of the Ukraine crisis, um, it was very clear that this was a different crisis. There was a ton of media attention. There was a ton of actors, of people who wanted to jump into the provision of information as a humanitarian need. And there was a lot of uh, resources. And, and this is significantly different than most crises where we're under-resourced, we're scrounging for money, we're trying to make best with what we had. So at the beginning, um, there was a, a ton of different um, activist uh, initiatives for information. Uh, people who were volunteers, who built organizations from nothing, who were Ukrainian, who wanted to uh, kind of serve their people as they were moving across Europe. Um, one of those organizations uh, is part of the International Rescue Committee's uh, emergency unit. That means we help respond to crises. But it also means that we are there to support partners in the midst of crises to build their own capacity. So we partnered with Google.org and with, the, um, with, the, with United for Ukraine to set up a pan-European information service. Um, that service um, provides information on things like education, housing, resettlement, uh, legal aid uh, in uh, over 20 countries across Europe. Um, and it was built as a network uh, from the start as activists uh, into something now that has a tremendous scope, receives thousands of messages in a day, uh, is able to house um, tens of thousands of people um, it, with temporary housing. And this project was incredibly uh, interesting. And it was interesting because it was a public, private, and large NGO partnership. So we had our local organization of United for Ukraine. We had our supporting international NGO as signpost at the International Rescue Committee. And then we had private support and from donors like, like Google.org, like Cisco, uh, like Zendesk, that allowed us to build uh, state-of-the-art technology that could serve people in the midst of a crisis. All of this happened within the span of a month, two months. 
uh, teams coming together. We had product managers from Google, and we had humanitarian responders in Ukraine, everyone melding their minds and kind of putting together a platform that served people's needs uh, collectively. Um, what was so interesting about this was that we were able to bring worlds together, share knowledge, and to do it rapidly in a way that I, I haven't um, ever experienced in other crises before. So, um, you know, we're really proud of that response at Signposts, and um, it's taught us a lot about how to scale. It's about scaling with partners. It's about empowering local organizations. It's about uh, giving um, at no cost uh, that capacity and being there to kind of build sustainable structures with corporate partners when you're in a, a spot where you have connections to them. That's awesome. Liam, quick question. I mean, like, this sounds like the dream of public-private partnerships that people talk about, have talked about for decades. Like, oh, if we only had public-private partnerships, everything would be solved. Um, can you talk through some of the challenges of bringing together folks from such different areas of expertise in a very kind of rapid action environment? Yeah, of course. So uh, there were conflicting interests and in, we had um, the United for Ukraine organization focused on we need action and we need action now. There are people in need, we're serving those people in need and it has to happen. The International Rescue Committee and Signposts, we were focused on uh, a combination of we need action now and we need to build a sustainable structure, right? And that's, that's its own incentive as an international organization. There has to be continuity in what we're doing. Mm. And then Google provided us with uh, 20 fellows. Um, they worked with us full time for six months. They provided us with uh, around 50 call center staff um, for manning our housing call center that de delivered uh, temporary housing to people. Um, and you know, with the Google fellows, they were like, what can we build? How can we build it? How fast can we build it? Um, so there's this tension where, where we were in this position as IRC saying, let's slow down, let's see the field. Um, and and it, kind of, it kind of all melded together though. What we were able to do was um, like collectively listen, but ultimately focus on what does United for Ukraine want? How can we empower United for Ukraine? How can we do that now, and how can we do it for years to come? That's awesome. Jordi, you operate kind of, you and your team operate at a really different scale because the search scale is, you know, you say something on search and it reaches millions and billions of folks. So how do you think about, and how does the search product team think about communicating or facilitating information access during crises like this one? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So the, when the crisis in Ukraine started back at the end of February, um, the initial focus of the team, we, we brought together a dedicated team, but from across a number of organizations, and the initial focus of the team was really on helping people in region there in Ukraine get access to trusted and authoritative information. Um, we have a, so, so the first thing that we do really is try to understand what information those people need, what information is available, um, and how we, we can work with, um, and this is Ruha's team, the partnerships team, work with people out there to, to make even more trusted information available. Um, we have an existing product uh, called SOS Alerts that had been developed for natural disasters, so for things like fires, floods, and earthquakes. Um, it, it, back in COVID, it started for the first time, it was used for sort of a pandemic response. And then for Ukraine, it was a, used for like a crisis or a conflict response. And so um, what we find is that there's uh, not a lot of information out there and we need to get out that authoritative information quickly. So we launched a, a set of an SOS alert in Ukraine for people there, uh, working with the UNHCR and the Red Cross and the Ukrainian foreign ministry to help people get safety tips access to help and hotlines. And for the Ukrainian foreign ministry, it was, it was uh, foreign student information for people, for foreign students in Ukraine. Now, as the, the crisis evolved, people's needs changed and um, where they were changed as well. So there were millions of people who moved from Ukraine into other countries in Central and Eastern Europe. And so at that point, we saw that there, was now, there were now needs in places like Poland, Romania, and Hungary. And so we ended up launching SOS alerts there as well. And this was providing information from 
for example, in Poland, it would be from the Polish government. They had created a lot of authoritative information, but it was hard to find. And so we made that available on the front page of Google in languages that in not only Polish, but also in Ukrainian and English. And the idea was to, you know, as quickly as possible, get this information out to people. So we had information from people in Ukraine, in Central and Eastern Europe, and then we also saw that there was a massive surge in interest and, and traffic coming to Google from people all around the world who were interested in um, information about, about the conflict. They wanted to know, you know, what was going on, statistics about it, potentially how they could help, where it was happening, and, and who it was, uh, like, who was happening to. Um, fortunately, Google works pretty well for these situations. You know, you have the, the 10 blue links that are always on the page there, top stories for really newsworthy situations, things that help people sort of explore more than just their, their initial query. So people also ask related searches, rich media like videos. Um, and we also, uh, in crises, have started to bring, and for big newsworthy moments, more structured information to the page starting in COVID, then in Ukraine, and then other situations. So now you'll see things like working with Reuters, we bring estimated losses or estimated impact. This is where people want to understand the magnitude of a situation. Um, we have rich images coming from, from Getty, and then there's also things around like mentioned in the news, which helps you understand what people are involved in these sorts of things. So we're trying to build things for Ukraine, but also make them scalable to crises in the future as well. So just to make it real for folks, when you say build things on search, what does it look like? You, so you've got your, someone puts in a query um, and they get a bunch of results. The blue links we call organic search. So that's just the algorithm doing its thing and it does a good job. Um, what your team builds is what? Like stuff at the top of search? Yeah, so when, when you look at the Google search page, it's, it's got a lot of uh, sort of different features. We call them on the page. So you have top stories. If you're looking on desktop on your browser, you'll have some stuff on the right-hand side of the page as well. Uh, up there, you know, often it will be something from Wikipedia, in the, or in the case of Ukraine, it would include estimated losses and images. Um, so what, what we do is we partner to, to get that information and, and build additional blocks on the page. And when we build them, as Ruho said, we try to build scalably and so that the organic or the, algor the algorithm works not only for this crisis, but for future crises of this type and for other types of crises as well. That's great. And then as a partnerships person at Google, I will say, you know, we recognize that Google's been around, you know, since 1995, or I should know this number, but uh, we haven't been around that long. Uh, and we certainly have not been experts in humanitarian response. And so, everything we show in these experiences is through partnerships. Partnerships with news organizations, partnerships with nonprofits and, and other organizations that work in this space that un understand information needs and how to communicate to folks um, in these times. Omar, GDPC, you guys operate somewhere in between Liam's uh, world of working kind of behind the scenes through a local NGO and then Jordy's world where we're kind of surfacing authoritative information from other folks. Can you talk to us about how you think about um, trust, reputation, mm. using the name of the Red Cross, and then also how you work from an international level right down to local communities? What does the Red Cross structure do to kind of enable that, that kind of work? Thanks. Yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack there. And actually, there's a lot to unpack from uh, yeah. my counterparts here on the stage. So I'm going to say a few things just to start. You know, one is that um, I'm really impressed with what Liam's done in, with Signpost in uh, Gray Sky Times in an emergency to be able to build something so dynamic and so important. Um, and I recognize how uh, incredible Google can be in, in really responding to data in order to put the right information in the right place for an audience that's really hungry for uh, consuming that information. Uh, at the Red Cross, we're, we're all about doing both of those things, um, but we do it within the limitations that we have necessarily. So partnership is really critical for us because it extends how we operate and how we work. Uh, the American Red Cross has been around for a long, long time. Um, people know who Clara Barton is, I think, in the room. Um, she was, uh, you know, having to respond to a telex uh, because there was a, you know, flood in, a, in another state. 
um, and then she would get in her, um, I'll get on a train or on a, a horse and wagon to get to uh, the response, and then she would start collecting data, and that data was about needs and what you know had to happen, and, and she was extending that uh, trusted emblem of the Red Cross at the time, um, building that community and building that um, rapport with with the American people. Internationally, it's the same thing. Every national society has this uh, responsibility to protect the emblem and put the emblem of the Red Cross or Red Crescent uh, out there so that people know that there's safety, that there's an opportunity for uh, receiving services or um, uh, support at the time of need. Uh, and in, in our case, with the GDPC, the Global Disaster Preparedness Center, we're really looking at you know how do we enhance that? How do we really improve that connection between the community and the Red Cross or Red Crescent Society? And a lot of the ways we do it is through technology. You know, we've introduced tools that in, that allow the trusted name of the of the national society to be used as a um, extension through other platforms like Google's. And the SOS alerts that um, that Jordy shared are an example where we said let's let's put the Red Cross's message about what to do when you get an alert into those alerts so that people know. Not only you know that something's happening, but they know what are the concrete steps that you can take, and they see that it's coming from the Red Cross. So they say, you know, this is an organization I trust. It's not the government. It's not you know just some uh, nonprofit or corporate organization that's been around for a few years, but rather it's an organization that we has been in my community and that has been helping us for a long time. So we're always looking for those opportunities, not just to do what we do really well which is help the community and, and really work with those. Uh, but we also look for ways to enhance that. And you know, one of the things that I'd love to, to explore with Jordy in this conversation is where does the data end? You know, where is the gap, right? So we know where people are receiving the information, but where are they not getting it? And so how can we work together to really extend our response or extend the work that Liam's doing, the signpost, to really connect and, and get the messaging out to those communities that aren't being reached, the channels that we have access to. I, I would love to come back to that. Um, speaking about safety tips and the SOS alerts, I was mm. on the other side of that partnership. And one thing that was really compelling for us in working with your organization is we were able to get safety tips for SOS alerts in the Philippines to Argentina, to you know France, from local organizations in those countries, in the local language, but also with local context, mm -hmm. um, and recommendations of what to do in a hazard change context by context. Mm -hmm. It's not just a language, it's not a translation issue, it's also you know people use different lexicon, people have different recommendations based on where you are. Can you speak to like the what now safety tip project and um, and how you all facilitated that on the Red Cross side. So we have this tool called What Now. It's an API that has safety messages in a number of languages contextualized to different countries um, and across 20 plus hazards and six different time scales. So in a one dimensional conversation about, an, about a hazard, uh, an early warning message can come out and we have the two or three uh, steps that can be taken, um, contextualized by each national society. What's behind that is an evidence-based set of resources that we developed called PAPE, Public Education, Public Awareness and Public Education Key Messaging, um, that really helps uh, educate and reinforce the, the need for common messages, for uh, contextualized messages that are, um, that are correct and that they're not uh, just a guess about what, what, can, what can happen. And so multiple organizations can use the same type of message. With what now, we created this tool which basically allows any organization that wants to be distributing uh, these key messages to utilize the API and ingest and, and incorporate them into other uh, resources. So into SOS alerts, we've been able to work with Google to add uh, what now, but we also have worked with small app developers who have uh, ideas about how they want to be able to communicate with a specific uh, con uh, con uh, group of people that they can actually pull in the API and add it to, to their messages. We've seen um, people take them offline and make them into analog tools. 
So um, BBC Media Action, for instance, used uh, the, the What Now messages to help with Zika uh, messaging um, during um, the, the Zika crisis a few years ago. Um, and we, we see this as being just the, the, the tip, though, because they're really one dimensional and they don't really uh, allow us to quickly address uh, the complex uh, emergencies that are happening. And so we, we're constantly trying to figure out, like, how do we stay ahead of the need? Um, you know, when you have uh, a complex emergency, it's, it's not OK to just tell people what to do when a flood comes. You need to tell them what the, the flood event is, but in the context of where they are at this time. And so subnational, localized, and contextualized messages are really critical, and we need to work in that direction. So we've been doing that you know, in, in practice, but, but to actually then translate it to the technology to achieve the scale, that's, that's a puzzle. That's a mystery. We're still working on it. Going back to your question of where, where are some gaps, like where should we go next in terms of uh, messaging and information needs. How um, in the, the folks who were on the panel before this were talking about the need for community engagement and community input in design. How do your teams think about engaging with communities to understand what are the gaps between what we're providing now and what we need to do next? Um, who wants it? Jordy, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Um... So um, the, the, let me talk a little bit about how, how Google builds products, and then we can talk uh, about how we engage with the community um, to, to make sure that we're building the right product. So um, the, the Google culture is all about for, you know, understanding what your users are looking for and trying to figure out how to be really helpful to them, then designing a product, building that product, and then launching it and what we call landing it, which really means that once you get it out the door, you're not done. You need to continue to iterate it on to make sure that you're really actually going back to, to that helpfulness that you uh, defined up front. And through that entire process, you're really trying to do research with users um, to understand and make sure that you're continuing to, to build something that's going to be really useful for them. Um, the user research function is one that's well established now, but I'll say I've been at Google for 12 years and it's it, had an incredible amount of investment over that time where people now appreciate it far more uh, than, than ever. I will say that you know, as we're building things for, for tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people, there's not one product uh, or, or one sort of set of information that's useful for everybody. So you need to ensure that the research that you're doing up front and throughout the process is real, with a really diverse panel or a really diverse portfolio of people. So up front, when we're doing qualitative research, you know, sort of deep research with smaller numbers of people, we really invest to make sure that we're getting a representative sample of different types of people from different socioeconomic and uh, different backgrounds. Um, as we move into kind of more quantitative surveys to understand at scale what people are looking for, again, you want to make sure that you're getting a really broad population. And then later on, we're, we're looking at metrics to try and then first we define the metrics up front to figure out what we're going to optimize for. And you want to make sure, again, that those are not kind of <clears throat> one dimensional but really capturing a broad set of information so that you're addressing uh, a, a, the broad set of needs that everybody has out there. And so it's really this uh, led by this user research organization. I feel very lucky that we have uh, the, this asset to be able to sort of do, pull in a broad set of stakeholders over time. Um, just kind of quickly on top of that, of course we recognize that Users don't have all the information. We also work with experts out there. We work with different organizations like the Red Cross, like the UN, with, with governments to understand what their people are looking for. And then that kind of all comes together to inform what, what the solutions that we build for people. Yeah, I can speak to it. So um, what's really cool about signposts and what we do is um, we're responding and interacting with people directly on the platforms they use the most. So most people across the globe, there was actually a stat that over 50% are using Facebook. Most people's search engine is Google, right? So we immediately know where the main platforms for our audience could be. So like in the way that there's consumer marketing to sell you some bag or something like that, um, we actually learn from our customers and how they inter interact, our clients, and how they interact with us based off of 
um, what they tell us. Um, so what's really cool is in, in the humanitarian sector, it's so often that your needs assessment, your understanding of what people need is done on your terms. You write the 10 questions. You ask the 10 questions on, the, on your terms at the border to enter Poland, for example. And it's on your terms that you're also understanding other people's needs. What's so cool about Signpost is we put our information out there, and that information is around um, you know, any type of need someone might have to answer their question in that given context. And the community will tell us what they need. We open up the ability for people to ask questions. We have moderators behind all of these systems. So someone can send a message in Telegram, Viber, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, et cetera, and ask us a question or tell us what they need, and we can revert directly back to them. Now, what that actually results in is a giant swath of data, and that data is really important. It's, it's one, something that you want to uh, protect, and two, it's something that we can learn from as an organization, as a, a, a general um, community of practice of aid responders. So when someone tells me that they need um, a food ration card, we can take them at their word that they in fact need a food ration card, right? And when they tell us that, or when a collective group of people tell us that, and we see that there is maybe misinformation about a camp in Kenya closing mm. or disinformation that's targeted against Ukrainians so that they don't leave. We need to, we need to be able to kind of see that from the ground truth, from the person's perspective. What's so cool about Signpost too is we're echoing, we're doing something called responsive information. When someone sends us a message, we respond back to them like they sent the message to us. If they send 15 emojis, we're gonna send them 15 emojis back with a little dragon and a, and a smiley face. And then if they send us a voice message, we're sending them back a voice message. And they're always sending messages to moderators who speak their language and are from their context. And that's what's so great is that we're able to kind of have this content pumping out in Dari, Pashto, Ukrainian, Russian, Swahili, Somali, whatever it is. Um, and people are able to, on their own terms, ask us these questions. And from that, there's, there's the ability to learn. Um, and we're, we're now kind of getting at the, at the point of advocacy of saying, here's what people want. This is what they say they want. Um, this is the information gaps that we see and what people ask. Now, let's do something about it collectively. I think what's really cool about this is that uh, we're actually starting to figure out the problem and, and identifying solutions. So for, for a while, it was just about just sending a message out. Like, and then there was really no, no effort. It's communicating in the format of whatever you know, people are communicating in. Um, there's still a challenge, though, because only about 80% of people uh, in the world are using smartphones. So, or technology, internet access. And so there's still a billion, billion and a half people in the world who aren't. And figuring out how to make that additional extension or communicating with people to communicate with others. Because you always know how to communicate with your grandmother or whoever it is that's not using a smartphone. People know how to do that. There are ways to make that happen. Um, but, but making those extensions and connecting the dots, I think, is really incredible. And it's an evolution that's just been happening recently. It hasn't happened really well for a long time. And all of a sudden, I think everybody's sort of a, acutely aware that there's a better way to communicate uh, with, with the community and to also to be listening and adjusting how we do our services, how we provide our services, how we cater our information um, to be able to have the right kind of impact. It's not good enough just to say, hey, I'm going to tell you something and I'll come back to you in two days and tell you something else. You know, you need to say, all right, hey, what do you need? And, and let me figure out how I can help connect you to the right information or resources that you need to have. Um, today, we're, we're way ahead of where we were five, ten years ago, and I'm really excited about where we're going to be in the future, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Do you have examples, Omar, of how um, GDPC or any of your partners do that feedback loop in your context? 
we're, we're, we're working on it. We're, we're always, I think, probably agitating in, this, in the sense that we're raising this as a challenge. Um, we use participatory approaches all the time at the community level in an analog format. Like we were just bringing mm. people together. We're listening to what, you know, the challenges. We're raising awareness about uh, vulnerability and risk. And we're saying, look, these are, these are the things that you uh, at the baseline need to be aware of. And then we're also hearing the knowledge that comes from the community to understand what it is that we can do. And then we're working with them to provide solutions to their biggest challenges. Emulating that approach in a digital way is almost impossible. I mean, it really requires almost real-time dynamic information sharing. And the audience we're talking about sometimes has low literacy or has, is communicating in multiple languages in order to have just that conversation we just had because they come from indigenous populations or they come from you know, groups that, that really are afraid to speak with people from the outside of their community. So building that trust, extending that, and then bringing the, the knowledge about how the, that sort of social uh, ecosystem and conversation can happen and translating into tech is, is really hard. But we need to do it because that's essentially how we're going to achieve further scaling. I'm, I'm confident of that. Um, but, but the solutions are still out there and we're, we're working on them. The GDBC is taking evidence too and doing research so that we can actually document the behavior change that we see, that we see the impact that we have, and then sharing that to be able to let people build on the good experience rather than just start from scratch over and over again. That trial and error is also an old way of working. You know, we, we need to really, you know, share that good experience and, and build on uh, the approach to, um, to have a better impact in the future. And I'm, I'm like one of the great things about partnering across organizations that work so differently with our users is to be able to leverage these insights. So, you know, GDPC and the Red Cross is not afraid to work offline in communities. And you've been doing that for over 100 years. Liam, the way Signpost works is super scrappy and flexible. And it sounds like very manual in many ways. So having unstructured feedback or doing responsive communication is requires real humans uh, to do that communication. And then we, you know, Jordi, you talked about when you build as an engineer or a product manager on search, we really have to figure out how do we optimize for being able to scale. And a lot of that is, can we automate something? Can we do it algorithmically? Um, I'm curious if anyone has examples here of how we've been able to thread the needle across these three different ways of getting feedback and learning from users. Jordi, we, you touched on this a little bit, but can you, can you actually talk a little bit about how we get feedback from users once a product is launched? What does that look like? Yeah, the, uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, that in the context of SOS alerts. Maybe we can also talk about uh, some of the feedback we got in terms of translations as well. So, um, you know, the, the, the purpose of the SOS alerts, as I mentioned, is to, to get trusted, authoritative information out as quickly as possible to people. So in the minutes and hours after a crisis starts, um, it's really the, you know, the, the organizations that are good at uh, getting information very quickly are, are organizations like Omar's organization, the Red Cross, uh, who can get authoritative information, or governments that are able to get this information out very quickly, and we can put it up on SOS alerts. We, we get user feedback on this over time. So people will, you know, <clears throat> as Liam mentioned, they'll, they'll submit information uh, to Google and we're able to analyze this user feedback, not only individually, but also at scale to see how useful they're finding these features to be. So we look at the user feedback plus the metrics and often we're able to then figure out, okay, people are also looking for this other type of information and we're, we are able to update the SOS alerts. What we also find is that people's needs change over time. So. Mm -hmm. They go from like, how can I stay safe to, you know, if it's in the, in the case of they've left Ukraine and they're now living in Poland, how can I find a place for my kid to go to school? How do I get an apartment? Where's the local grocery store or potentially the food bank I can go and get food from? And so their needs become more complex. In addition, the information out there on the web also becomes more, more richer and more complex as well. And so we find actually that the, the SOS alerts actually become less useful to, to people searching uh, than the, the, or, the organic results or the algorithmic results that search provides every day. 
And at that point, we end up actually taking down the SOS alerts and letting search do the job that it does when you go to it on a daily basis. Um, and so that, that's where we're able to use user feedback plus mm -hmm. metrics together to be able to inform what's useful to people and, and react to it. Um, maybe one other uh, sort of interesting thing the, to talk about is uh, the feedback that we got and as we, uh, from people who are in uh, Central and Eastern Europe and Poland, um, as they were looking for information on search about these kind of more complex needs. <coughs> One of the things that we discovered was that there was a real gap in terms of the, their ability to uh, look for information, you know, a language gap. So these were people coming from Ukraine. They were, you know, they spoke Ukrainian, of course, uh, and they were wanted to find information uh, from what was predominantly a, like a Polish web corpus or a, a, a Polish set of information. So what they were doing at the time was they were uh, they would go type something in Ukrainian into a translation app translate it into Polish, go to search, copy and paste it into the search query, get a set of Polish results, translate that into Ukrainian, click on all the links that they thought were useful, bring up those pages, translate all those into Ukrainian. You know, as you can imagine, this is a, an incredibly laborious process and they were missing out on good information as well because it was just take so long uh, to find, the, the, find this information. So one of the things that we did was working with the, the research team does a lot of translation work at Google. So it was the search plus the research team combined, um, brought some stuff that we made available in other countries, plus some, uh, some new features, and it built kind of an end-to-end -end translation flow. So people would go, and if they typed Ukrainian into the search bar in, uh, in Poland, they would get back a set of results in Ukrainian right there on the page. If they clicked on those results, it would provide them with uh, the, the landing page of the site. Maybe it was a Red Cross site, or maybe it was a signpost site, um, right back in Ukrainian. So they actually didn't need to do anything in Polish, and they were able to find the information they needed there. So it was based off of the, this user feedback of people not being able to find what they were looking for, people not being able to get results in their local language, that we were able to evolve the product and help them out. So this is, just so I understand, this is a Ukrainian person in Poland doing a search in Ukrainian, getting Polish results, but that are translated for them. So it's still resources in their new host country, but now translated for them through this flow. Exactly, so they, would, cool. they would go to Google, they would type something in in Ukrainian, they would get back results in Ukrainian, though they were Polish results, then they would click on those results to go and see the, the page, and that would be translated as well. So yeah. they could do the entire flow in Ukrainian. Very I think, cool. I think what I'm, what you just described is you're, you put people in the center of everything that you're doing, just like Signpost is doing, and I think that's really important. I mean, when we talk about uh, early warning messages and the need to have the right information at the right time, in the right channel, in the right format, in the right language, it keeps going, yeah. but it's all about the person who's gonna receive that message, and having the right message for the right people at the right time is critical, and their needs change over time, which you described really well, because you know, you need to know that the, the flood is coming or the storm is coming or fire is coming, whatever it is, and then you, you need to know what actions to take. But, you know, once you've taken those actions, you need to know the next thing. And that sort of evolution of need that people have is still about people. It's still about the people at the center of this. And I think that the, the way that Google's been using their technology, not to just, we don't want to just focus on Google because I think that there are a lot of other examples of this. Yeah. Really being dynamic to the needs of individuals and their, you know, the people that they're, they're taking care of um, in time through crisis is really mm -hmm. critical. And that requires, that requires resources. So as Red Cross or International Rescue Committee, there are certain resource constraints. And one of the things that we have it prioritized as a sector is user experience research, is user experience design in the way that Google's really made a name out of it. Like, uh, and, and I think that that's, that's one of the things that's really important. It's done ad hoc, it's done by uh, people with the best intentions, but it requires resourcing. Um, so that's a really important thing to kind of acknowledge. Um, as, as, a, as a sector, that's something that's important because otherwise our technology is going to suck. It will, because it's not built for the person who's going to use it. 
On that theme of listening to community, we have about 15 minutes left, so I'd love to open it up to the audience, both online and in the room here with us, if anyone has questions for the panel. There's one up there. Back there. Thank you. <clears throat> so my, my name is uh, Jesus Melendez from uh, IREX. Um, uh, I'm very interested on in, in, uh, the development and, and management of uh, partnerships between international NGOs and local and national NGOs or national societies in the case of the Red Cross in context of uh, digitalization of, of, of activities. Um, I think you, you, you all have touched on that. But I wanted to ask you in particular, or more, more in particular, I mean, the case of Ukraine and, and, and other cases that you've come across, you know, how, how are you managing the, 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 the sort of power balance that exists in, in, these, uh, in these partnerships from the perspective of resources or access to resources, from funding to technical expertise, agency uh, or risk management, compliance, lack of trust and uh, ways of being, which is uh, an example of that would be, for instance, the, the understanding of local contexts. Um, so, I mean, if you could elaborate more, if you like, on Ukraine or beyond Ukraine, it would be super interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. So we, um, you know, International Rescue Committee is a giant organization. It has its own protocols, its own uh, policies, and everything that it needs to do. But simultaneously, we have a mandate to serve people. Uh, and that mandate to serve people almost always leads to the same logical conclusion, which is it is best to serve people with people who are the closest to your audience, right? Uh, and that's, that's going to be through local partners. That might be through activist groups. It might be through an NGO that's been in Ukraine since 1942. You don't know. But I would say that. The, 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 hur the hurdles that you mentioned, legal compliance, like data sharing agreements, uh, the types of things that, that take time to progress, uh, require trust with your partners. So at the outset, we kind of, when we showed up with uh, United for Ukraine and started talking through what would make the most sense as partners, um, we asked and we listened. Um, and we put ourselves in a position of humility and saying, like, you know the context, tell me what, we, what you need, right? Um, and then the second part is, 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 is being steadfast and consistent with your messaging and your, and your giving uh, status. So, right, as in a larger uh, aid organization or kind of uh, as IREX, you know, you know, organizations with authority, um, um, you're able to kind of be in a position to give, and that giving uh, is important. Um, it should be framed as not a, a transaction of a partnership, but it's rather uh, we're all here giving to a collective mutual goal, and that collective mutual goal is something tangible. So at the outset, we were able to kind of create strategy documents, create stra a strategy collectively, and we did that at the outset of the crisis, even when we didn't know everything going on. And that was important for the organizations to actually meld together and trust each other, because we, we spent the time to think through things together. Um, legal, compliance, those things fall into place, but they should never be the risk that outweighs you going into that engagement, right? And, and unless it's at the expense of the end user that you're doing that, you know, it's really important that you take the time. We have these systems for a reason. They're not to cover our own organizations. They're, they're to uh, allow us to provide services to people better. So shared principles at the outset, a shared framework strategy, and then recognizing that some of the bureaucracy is there actually to protect the user and, and make us work responsibly in, yeah. in crisis. Yeah. Well, from online, from Rula, um, a question from our online audience. Rula asks Omar and Liam, how do you safeguard confidentiality and mitigate risking people's lives with technological openness? I'll start with the answer. I think it's a really important point. I mean, there are uh, legal frameworks that have been put in place to protect people's online privacy, uh, protect people's identity, and I think those are, are important building blocks. 
but they, they are not the end of our commitment to um, individuals and uh, the people that we serve. So uh, we're, we're very careful about how we um, collect and share personal identifying information. I think that we are also looking at what are the solutions on the horizon to help us uh, transfer the, the responsibility of, of uh, data protection to uh, to the individual, you know, so that they're actually owning and, and maintaining that data themselves and not giving it to any organization that, you know, is offering them support. Um, thinking through with multiple organizations how we use blockchain and other uh, solutions to be able to do that is uh, part of our job, part of our responsibility. I don't think we're there yet um, because the, the points of entry are too, um, are, are too complex, but I think that for, um, at the same time, you know, there are a lot of organizations that are really quick to jump into the new technologies uh, and they do so at the risk or at the, um, uh, at the expense of those who they're actually trying to protect. Uh, biometric, there's a lot of examples of this um, that are happening in, in camps and other places. And I think that the risk there, you know, shouldn't outweigh the, the, um, uh, the opportunity. And so we need to be really careful and we need to make sure that we're humani our humanitarian accountability is maintained through the work that we're doing with um, uh, the technologies that are emerging. Yeah, and I think Omar put it really well, and I, but I would, I would add on an additional thing, is that we're in a new age of humanitarian delivery. There, there's a digital component to almost every project that rolls out. And what I come across frequently is like people asking the idea of, is it GDPR compliant? Is your technology this? Is it that? Without like stopping to think of why does that system exist? It's, mm -hmm. That system exists for legal protection, of course, and, but there's a step beyond that. Like now there are state actors who may have interest in humanitarian information. Now there are reasons why people's data is valuable, right? The, we, we'll have data of, of you know, vulnerable information and that information is something that has to be protected. So similar to the way that a large company would protect this information, making it Fort Knox, having cybersecurity, um, having those investments, it is critical to do this type of work because um, GDPR uh, compliance is not enough. It's not enough to just check the box on your legal compliance, you know? So it's, it's a really important thing. Thanks for ans asking that question. Jordy, anything on your end? I mean, I think Omar and Liam covered it yeah. very well there. We, we, and on search, we, we're less kind of on the ground interacting with people um, face to face. But these, you know, this principle of privacy by design is also baked into how every feature we work on in the company is, is built because of this, this concept of like once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's very hard to get it back. Any other questions? Hi. I think we have one up here. Uh, thank you so much for um, the really informative and insightful presentations. I think my question is for Liam and, and Jordy. Um, thinking about um, crises we've seen over the last decades, you know, pre-Ukraine, I'm thinking of Syria, I'm thinking of uh, Iraq uh, with the ISIS crisis and so on. Um, we didn't see the sort of uh, response or solutions that we saw emerge with Ukraine. Uh, so my question is, you know, what do you think were the main obstacles to that? Why did that not happen? Was it just resources, interest, or, you know, what are the other factors at play? And how do we address those so the next time there is a crisis that isn't in Eastern Europe, we are equipped to respond in the same way that we have? So I can say that the first thing is that there is, there is institutional racism in the way in which the media cycle works. And the media cycle is what makes the donor money come, right? And, and so there's a very clear connection between the way that the media works and the way that we capture money, um, which then drives the humanitarian programming. So where you may have a surplus for Ukraine, you may not have it elsewhere. So the first thing about it is, is from as a technology practitioner, we need to think about one, combining resources, working together across organizations, because none of us have a surplus, right? We're, we're doing what we can with what we can. The second is that we're looking at equity 
from a needs perspective. Like equity doesn't, it, while we need to think about the, the degree of need in every different given context. Um, so there aren't forgotten crises, right? Um, one of the big things that um, David Miliband, the president of IRC, says frequently uh, on all social media platforms is we cannot forget our, our, our duty to support people across the globe. It's not just in Ukraine. While in Ukraine there is a gigantic and acute need, there's also a gigantic and acute need in Yemen, in Ethiopia. So we as practitioners need to think about how we use those resources in an equitable way. And at Signpost, the way in which we do it is we try and work through partners. Uh, we try and get free technology that we can grant out. And we try to keep the overhead of, what, of support of these projects centralized so that we're able to bear the brunt of punches in every direction. And we're not focusing on a project by project by project basis, but we're trying to make it so that we're building something sustainable where we can deploy to a place that is not being funded. Um, like, if, for instance, we have projects in Niger and in Ecuador where there is not a lot of donor money for what's going on there. Um, so it's really important that we think about it that way. Yeah, uh, just to add to what Liam said, I, I think it's a great question. I mean, when we were working on Ukraine, we had a lot of discussion about um, displaced challenges of displaced people around the world and other types of crises as well. And so when we're, when we're looking at these needs, we're evaluating not only how can we help people immediately in this particular situation, but how, what, how can we build things and build solutions and partner with people and get access to information to make it available that will be useful for this type of crisis, for other types of crises uh, in the future. And so a lot of the work that we've done, I in fact have like an entire team dedicated to dealing with what <clears throat> sort of big newsworthy moments to figuring out how we can do it quickly and address it at scale in an algorithmic way so that we can do this not only for Ukraine but for all crises going forward. Any other questions? We've got two minutes-ish, so probably time for one, one final question. Yeah, there's, a, there's a question up near the front here. One yeah, up here. And maybe there's mm -hmm. online too. Yeah, I was going to give you one more from online. We've had a few questions rolling in. Um, this one is from James. It says, what efforts have there been to incorporate social scientists' expertise, and are you mainly focusing on technology solutions? This is to anyone on the panel. So great. So as the partnerships person, I will give one example from this is um, from our earthquakes uh, early warning work. We worked with social scientists who specialize in communicating risk. Uh, so folks from the academic sector rather than practitioners who bring a very different flavor of knowledge and kind of longer term and more systemic views of how different players in these ecosystems interact with each other. They're thinking about trust. They're thinking about um, trust of certain actors versus others. So yeah, absolutely. We, we look to sociologists, social scientists, academics, and other fields when we're, when we're doing our initial design thinking. I think Jordi mentioned this. Like, user input is really important, but input from experts, you know, government experts who, who are expert in government communication in, in times like this, but also um, folks who are researching these, these questions one step removed, which I think is really important because it allows them to step away and, and have a more kind of objective view of the problem space and what, some, what the right solutions are. We, we work with social scientists all the time. Um, I think that a lot of the research we do uh, through different academic channels is really about behavior and what are people's reaction when they receive a message, how are they going to react better or more you know, appropriately if, they, if the message is tweaked, um, and how can we save lives through that, those means. All right. With that, thank you all for joining us. Thanks for joining us online as well as here in person. And we look forward to chatting with you and attending some of these other sessions that are coming up. Thank you. Thanks for having us.